Well, good morning, church. I wonder if you've ever discovered something incredible in your own life that had just completely reframed the way you saw things. It was only about a month ago where Ray Jensen here at church made this incredible discovery on our church uh, property here. While he was working in that gully in between the two parking lots, uh, he found uh, a rusty old device and he was a bit unsure of what this thing might be. Well, he took a photo of it and he sent it to a friend and then he sent to another friend and suddenly someone at the RAF base made a comment when they looked at the picture of it that this might be something important. This might be a World War II initiator cap, a type of small explosive that well, no, sorry, I'm just joking. <laughs> a small explosive that lets off a bigger explosion. And it's amazing that how a little discovery can suddenly reframe all of our priorities, isn't it? All the boys, I mean all the male pastors who have grown up enjoying anything with explosive capacities, suddenly came to life. Hold all our meetings, Tracy. There's something big happening. We've got to look into this. And so we men gathered ourselves, and we went to venture deep into the heart of the Goy. We were carefully tiptoeing through the bushes until we could locate this said device. And as amateur explosive experts, we then found it and made certain observations using the pointy end of a stick. <laughs> of course, suggestions were soon to follow. Perhaps we throw a rock at it. Perhaps we take it to a high point and drop it, but then you're standing underneath it. Perhaps we just throw it as far as we can and see what happens. Well, the police arrived. And we love these guys. They fit right in with us. They suggested perhaps we prop it up and take shots at it. <laughs> and we're like, that's a great idea. Let's, we're going to determine its explosive capacities here. Well, somebody with a little more wherewithal finally came around, an actual explosive expert, and uh, they weren't any fun at all. <laughs> Turns out it's just a piece of old road machinery. Nothing to it at all. But that did not stop us from coming back into the church building with it and accidentally dropping it in front of Tracy at the front desk before we told her that. <laughs> this might not be explosive, but her reaction was, we all hit the deck. <laughs> there are times in our life where we make a discovery and it totally reframes our perspective on how we are to move forward. Today we're concluding our Chronicle series entitled Faithful to God's Story, and we do so remembering it's a book written for a people who are looking to discover a way forward in life. Because the post-exile community of Israel, they've returned from Babylon to Jerusalem. They've rebuilt the temple, but the spirit of God did not return as in the days of old. Things were not the same. And they had no idea how to move forward. They wondered, does God still care about us? And Ezra then writes Chronicles reminding the people to remain faithful to God's story, that we can still trust God, that He is still in control. And then in 2 Chronicles, the, the author narrows into the history of the kings. And it's through the kings that we see just how unfaithful Israel had been in their covenant relationship with God. Israel's sin had caused a separation from God and his blessings. They become like a prisoner to the sinful cultures around them. And it finally led to their Babylonian captivity. And yet, even so, the chronicler expected God to establish a new covenant based not on our behavior, but on his good and faithful love towards us. Can you hear the anticipation of Christ? 
in the messiness of everything they are experiencing and going through, a key verse emerges that it speaks into our own life today. And through, it's through this verse that all the kings are then weighed in their life. It's found in 2 Chronicles 7.14. It says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. The story of Chronicles is telling us something true about each of our lives and the times in which we live. Like the Babylonian captivity, sin leaves us a prisoner to a broken way of life. You just look at the nightly news, our media feeds. We are so far from home. We are exile. We can feel its tension in our communities. And we see people responding to reconcile this felt tension in all sorts of ways. And navigating our way forward, we see all sorts of clashing of worldviews, don't we? Even within our own society. And yet our way forward is not something any law of the land can satisfy. Our way forward is not something we can buy or take. It's not a relationship. It's not personal gratification. It's not an escape from reality. Our way forward is in Christ's word alone, in whom we trust, Christ alone. One John describes Jesus as the word of God made flesh, who made his dwelling among us, a Christ in whom we discover our way home. And I know that might sound funny if you haven't grown up in the church and you haven't heard things like that before, but I'm, what I want to say to you that even today you can experience this kind of life as you listen to the Chronicler's advice who says, humble yourself. Listen into what God has to say. Come and experience real life. As we open up 2 Chronicles 34, we're going to be reading about a king named Josiah who lived in a messy and divided culture, and yet he discovered something that reframed his entire worldview. He discovered an ancient story of God, a story of God in which he's seeking a relationship with his people, a book of promise, a book of covenant, a book of God's word. And maybe you've come today and you might be experiencing a situation in which you're looking for a way forward. A way forward in relationship, a way forward in certain thinking patterns that you've come into a rut in, a way forward in the way you speak and interact with people, a way forward in a health issue or just something at a job you need to find a way forward in, something more to life than this. And like Josiah, there's a dusty book that might be in your house that you haven't opened in a long time. A book describing God's love for you, desiring a relationship for you. A God who wants to show you a way forward in the places you need it most. And it's an invitation to live faithful to God's story. Would you pray as we open the word? Father, your Psalms declare the word is a light unto our feet. Your word a guide through troubled times. We are listening to this advice of the Chronicle today, the author who invites us to call out to you, humble ourselves, and turn our lives into alignment with your kingdom. Speak to your people as we pray. And everyone said, amen. You know, King Josiah, he was quite young when he took the throne. And yet, even at his young age, he knew in the broken world that he was born into, there must be something more to life. If you read about Josiah's dad, you learn about King Amon. And the Bible says he did not humbly follow the Lord. And apart from God, a culture under his reign had formed that was both deprived and divided. It got so bad that we read this in chapter 33, verse 24. Amon's own officials the people that worked for him conspired against him and assassinated him in his palace, in his home. 
And then the people of the land killed all those who had plotted against King Amon. And they made Josiah, his son, king in his place. What a mess. And in this culture, he's just a boy. But he knew already, I'm looking for something more to life than this. Some of you might have been born into a mess yourself. You might have caused a mess. You might be going through a mess. But the good news is this. Half the battle of moving forward is just recognizing you can no longer just stay where you are. When you can look at your circumstance and say, I might not know how I'm going to move forward yet, but I know I just can't stay here. And if that's you, God has a good word for you. Josiah was born into a mess. The moral backbone of Israel was broken. The people were divided. The surrounding cultures full of sexual perversity, full of sacrifices, even human sacrifices to these pagan gods, full of corruption, all these things had crept into the life of Israel. And nobody had any idea how to move forward anymore. Josiah did not know a time in his life where things were going well. But then he remembered the stories of old, of his great-grandfather John spoke about last week, King Hezekiah. And he remembered others who had a heart for God, like King David. And Josiah had what we might describe today as a spiritual awakening. Josiah has to look back before he's ready to move forward. He looks back to see where things went off track. He looks back to realign to what he's heard makes for a life. He looks back and remembers only the kings who found peace in the land were those who humbly sought the Lord. And he adopts this attitude. We see it across his life. In chapter 35, you read that at age 16, Josiah begins seeking the Lord. At age 20, he tears down the idols. At 26, he builds up the Lord's temple. And in doing all this, he suddenly makes an incredible discovery of God's word. It transformed the nation. Josiah's overall attitude of seeking the Lord allowed him to keep discovering the next step forward in life. And something that we can learn from today. Just listen into these three major steps of faith that emerge in the text. Step one, Josiah determined to seek the Lord. Chapter 34, verses 1 to 3 goes, Josiah was eight years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and followed the ways of his father David, not turning aside to the right or to the left, in the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father David. Now, that turn of phrase, not turning to the right or the left, is the author's way of saying that he was wholehearted in his pursuit of God, just like King David in the past. And it was a kind of devotion that transformed Josiah's worldview, but it also brought reformation throughout Israel. It leads into the second step. In the Reformation, Josiah tore down the idols. Continuing on in verse 3, in his 12th year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, Asherah poles, and idols. Under his direction, the altars of the Baals were torn down. He cut to pieces the incense altars that were above them and smashed the Asherah poles and the idols. So at age 16, Josiah knew something's got to change. These places of idol worship, they're terrible. Not only had the people moved away from God, but in their twisted thinking of minds, they had somehow come to think that this idol worship somehow appeased the gods and made the land prosper. And let's be clear about one thing. It was not easy to tear down these idols for him. It was hard. The people would have been angry, they would have been upset, they would have been confused, they would have been saying things to him like, Josiah, what are you doing? We gotta do whatever it takes, whatever sacrifice, doesn't matter. Freedom to do as we please, to get what we want, no matter the price. Wealth, crops, power, health, sexual fulfillment. Josiah, don't tear these things out of our lives. If we stop doing these things, the whole system might collapse. And Josiah said, don't you know? Can't you see? The system is already collapsed. I'm cleaning house. I'm tearing down what's holding us back. 
Have you ever got so tired of the, thing, the way things are going that you're just ready to tear down what's holding you back? I've had enough. This can't go on anymore. I need something more. And it was hard work for Josiah. It would have taken time. It wasn't pleasant. It came at a cost. And don't we know in our own lives, old habits die hard. People were used to doing things a certain way, and things had to change. Josiah knew one thing. You can't move forward when you're living in the wrong direction. He would not be half-hearted. God, I'll give you 10%. I'll take out 50% of the idols in my life. I'll do whatever you want on the weekends, but God, on my weekdays, I just need to do as I please. Say what I need to say. Do what I need to do. But that's not Josiah. Josiah says, no, I'm humbling myself. God, 100%, I'm listening to your word, Lord, you get it all. Whenever we tear down a broken part of our life, it's going to cost us something as it's set right. And maybe you've had a certain way of thinking and a pattern of thinking, a certain way of behaving, a certain way of speaking, and then it's the wrong thing, and you decide that's it, that's got to go. And suddenly your vocabulary becomes quite limited. Your style for letting off steam gets cramped. The way you do business, the way you go about your life. All these destructive habits that we've even perhaps found comfort in, we've found useful over the years, suddenly they have to get tore down so God can do something new in our life. Don't we know there's always a death before we see a resurrection? Listen to step three. Josiah built up the Lord's temple. Listen to how many things of cost you can pick up on in various different ways as he builds it up. Chapter 34, 8 through 12. In the 18th year of Josiah's reign, to purify the land and the temple, he then sent uh, Sa Saphon along with a team to repair the temple of the Lord his God. They went to Hilkiah, the high priest, and gave him the money that had been brought into the temple of the God, which the Levites, who were the gatekeepers, had collected from the people. Then they entrusted it to the man appointed to supervise the work on the Lord's temple. These paid men were the workers who repaired and restored the temple. They also gave money to the carpenters and the builders to purchase the dressed stone and timber for the joints, the beams of the building, and the kings of Judah that the kings of Judah had allowed to fall into ruin. The workers labored faithfully. So he's 26 years old. He's determined to seek the Lord. He's torn down the idols. He's faithfully sought to build up the Lord's temple. And the author is saying this. It's in the context of faithful labor, of our faithful seeking of God, an incredible discovery of God's word is made. Deep in the heart of the temple, a dusty book of the law is uncovered. A letter describing God's relationship with Israel and how we are to live faithfully in his story. It goes on in 14 through 21. While they were bringing out the money that had been taken into the temple of the Lord, Hilkiah, the priest, found the book of the law of the Lord that had been given through Moses. Hilkiah said to Saffron the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. And the, he took it and informed the king, Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a book. And Saffron read it in the presence of the king. And when the king heard the words of the law, he tore his robes. Great is the Lord's anger that has poured out on us because those who have gone before us have not kept the word of the Lord. They have not acted in accordance with all that is written in the book. In the context of seeking, Josiah discovers God's word, a covenantal relationship with God and his people, and it totally reframed his perspective. Now, Josiah had grown up with the priests all the time, telling them about God's covenantal love, going to church every Sunday morning. But now he's hearing God's word for the first time on his own, and it changes everything. He recognizes for himself 
how far astray they had gone. And in his distress, he tears his robes. It's a cultural sign that he's saying, God, we are undone. We are a mess. God, help us. I remember a friend of mine who had done some time in prison before he came to faith. And I'll never forget what he said to me one day. He said, Ryan, I knew I was doing wrong all along, but I didn't know how far gone I was until I opened the Bible for myself. I was a prisoner to sin before I was a prisoner in jail. But when I heard God's word in my life, I was hearing freedom for the first time. Josiah found the story in which our lives belong. And he responded with humility. And when he did that, the Lord sent word through a prophet who said, because your heart was responsive and you humbled yourself before God when you heard what was spoken against this place and his people, and because you humbled yourself before me and you tore your robes and you wept in my presence, I have heard you, declares the Lord. Now I will gather you to your ancestors, and you will be buried in peace. What's our response to God's word in our life? We see people are searching for a way forward in so many different kinds of ways, but Josiah has shown us the steps. It begins with a commitment to seeking God. God, things are a mess and this and that, and God, I'm I'm looking for a way forward with you. And this idea of tearing down the broken idols and then building up the temple, it takes on such special significance in the New Testament, doesn't it? Because Jesus comes to dwell with us. He says we are his temple. 1 Corinthians 3.16, do you not know that you are God's temple and God's spirit dwells in you? Building up the temple means making room for Christ to grow in us. And this looks like us taking time to hear his word, to pray to him, to know what his word says in the Bible, and to align our lives with it. And to do that, it means clearing out all the idols, all the garbage, all the messy noise in our lives, so we have space to hear his voice, who's telling us how to move forward. I don't know about you, but... I've noticed this, that when people are going through crisis, one of the big things I often hear the conversation going around is, he said, she said. We need more about what does God say about this. What is God's scripture telling us about the way forward, the truth about how we're going to do it? How do we be faithful to God's story regardless of what we might be experiencing? And if you're not sure, where your Bible is at the moment, it's in a dusty corner. It's time to rediscover it. Time to learn to step in. If you're not sure how to do it, there is so many good resources out there. You can talk to a pastor, turn to a friend that can help you. You can get a book like How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth, book by book by Gordon Fee. You can get your hands on a Bible commentary in the library. You can get a Bible study Bible. All these things are ways in which we learn how to move forward with God, to hear his voice. I love how Josiah responds to the invitation to a restored relationship. Just imagine this incredible moment in the life of history of Israel. He gives this original king's speech. He gathers all the people from all the land. Doesn't matter the age, doesn't matter the position in life. He gathers them all to tell them the story of God. 29 through 33, then the king called together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. He went up to the temple of the Lord with the people of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the Levites, all the people from the least to the greatest. He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the Lord's temple. The king stood by his pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord, to which to follow the Lord and keep his commands, statutes, and decrees with all his heart, all his soul, and to obey the words of the covenant written in the book. Then he had everyone in Jerusalem, and Benjamin pledged himself to it. And the people of Jerusalem did this in accordance with the covenant of God. I can't help when I hear that to wonder what that would look like in our world today if our leaders did that, if more people were interested in hearing about this old book 
as telling us the way forward. The reason why I'm so passionate about a message like this is because I see a broken world searching to discover a way forward. Don't you? It's a mess. But just like in Josiah's day, so many have forgotten there's a dusty old book that's been put into the corner of society. And if we only knew the invitation that God kind of has on offer for us, if we only knew, and it's times such as this that we gather like in Josiah's day to tell the story again, to remember the covenant of a loving God. And we commit to sharing this good news of Jesus so our land might be healed. And we know how to move forward. That's what we're doing right now. Don't you remember 714, how the Chronicles begins to talk about the history of the kings, the history of our times. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, if my people will pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear them from heaven. I will forgive their sins. I'm going to set things right. I will heal their land. I'm going to do it. It's amazing that out of that time of saying, yes, God, that Josiah and the people make it, it moves right into chapter 35. And what is it talking about? It's talking about the Passover. They celebrate the Passover lamb. So even back then, the author knows God has got to step into history. Christ comes as our Passover lamb, the lamb that was slain, the lamb that brings us life by the shedding of his blood. He came to set things right. And as we enter into a time of communion, I am reminded of, of a favorite song. And it's written by a homeless man amongst a group of broken people. It was accidentally recorded in a bar in the 70s, surrounded by drunks, surrounded by people that were lost and looking for a way forward. We read about this story. He writes the song, Jesus' Blood Never Failed Me Yet. Gavin Breyer writes, in 1971, when I lived in London, I was working on a film about people living rough in the area around Elephant and Castle and Waterloo Station. And in the course of being filmed, some people broke into a drunken song. Sometimes bits of opera, sometimes sentimental ballads, and there was this one old man, a homeless man, who did, in fact, did not drink, but he sang a religious song. It's very simple. He said, Jesus' blood never failed me yet. You can still hear it online today if you Google it. And when I played it at home, I found that his singing was in tune with my piano. And I noticed that it made a quite a, a powerful loop. And I took that loop to the university where I was working in the fine arts department and I, I copied it onto a reel. And I was thinking I'd maybe add an orchestrated accompaniment. And while it was recording onto tape on the loop, I left the door to the recording room open, which opened onto a larger painting studio. And I left it all plain, door open, I just wanted to go get a cup of coffee. And then when I came back, I was walking through the artist studio and I found the normally lively room unnaturally subdued. People were moving about much more slowly. Some were sitting alone, quietly, and there was others that were weeping. And I was puzzled until I realized the tape was still playing and they had been overcome by the old man's song. I want you just to imagine that scene. 
in this broken old bar room late at night, people with messy lives. It's an old homeless man with a voice that cuts through it all. The song would go something like, Jesus' blood never failed me yet. Never failed me yet. Jesus' blood never failed me yet. But there's one thing I know that he loves me so. If you're looking for a way forward, Jesus' blood never failed me yet. There's one thing you know, he loves you so.